don't go beyond that. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about genomic, uh, genome-wide prediction in plant breeding, practicable or otherwise. I mean, it's a general topic. But so this would be the general plan for today's uh, uh, talk. Starting from uh, Brassica natus, uh, as Andrea already uh, told you about Brassica natus, it's an amphidiploid of uh, uh, Brassica rapa and Brassica ulleraceae. So we have uh, uh, 38 chromosome in, in Brassica natus. Now coming to um, my actual project, the aim of my project is to develop genomic prediction models simply to identify best parental combinations for high heterosis. So the material I'm using is the diverse population of uh, canola, uh, ripe seed. Uh, we have two invert lines, uh, as Andrea already said, uh, crossed with 475 genetically diverse uh, males. And we have 950 uh, hybrids. Uh, these have been tested in uh, different locations already in Germany. And uh, the phenotypic data have been obtained by the company. And now we, are, uh, we will use uh, SNP data. We will use uh, transcriptomic and metabolomic data also with the collaboration of uh, IPK Gartsleben uh, in Germany. So uh, these are some of the glimpses of uh, my uh, lab work uh, the last three months. I mean, just some, but uh, there are a lot more. So, as you can see, as I started from, um, from simple plants and then I collected the leaves and I went through different uh, processes. But anyway, at the end, uh, we got the DNA and as you can see, this uh, nice you know, label here. Okay, uh, breeding can be uh, classified in or, or put into two categories in general or in two eras actually. Uh, we have a classical breeding and uh, we have uh, mm, a molecular marker year, which is post molecular marker year, so that is marker assisted selection and uh, genomic selection. So, what happens in, in classical breeding is that uh, we take only phenotypic data or field data, you can say, uh, from individuals, their close relatives, or their progenies, and we uh, predict the genotype of the next generation. Now, the main advantage of uh, Classical breeding is the tremendous increase in, in the yield of uh, different crops and grains. And uh, as you can see, there is a, a steady increase in the production uh, of different um, grains in the last uh, century or so. But there are some issues attached to such kind of methodology. Uh, the first one is expensive phenotyping. I mean, you have to do the uh, field testing for each cross. And the, uh, there's a large breeding cycle, so the time factor is also involved in that. And uh, some favorable alleles of small effects are m mostly ignored in, 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 in the case of complex effects. And it uh, takes a long time to declare a variety, almost uh, 15 to 20 years. So that's a classical breeding. Now we come to molecular breeding, which is uh, marker-assisted selection. So it is used in, in plant breeding, but uh, it addresses only genes with, uh, with large effects, marker assisted selection. So the question is, what about uh, many loci for small effects? Uh, here uh, we have an example of uh, milk uh, fat percentage in dairy. So I borrowed this from animal science section, uh, uh, just to give you a sense of the so here we have this uh, trait, which is, sim uh, which is a simple trait, actually, at, uh, which is controlled by uh, DGAT1 gene. And we have an example of overall uh, complex traits, which you can see uh, is controlled by very many loci of small effects. Now coming to genomic selection. Uh, Mivesson and his colleagues in 2001 uh, produced this paper which actually give birth to this uh, kind of methodology. Uh, they call it genomic selection. So what happens in, in this genomic selection that we use all available uh, markers, genome-wide markers, simultaneously to estimate the breeding values. 
And uh, then we do selection based on those est estimated uh, breeding values or genomic estimated breeding values. So that was the general uh, definition. Now, genomic selection can be executed in four basic steps. We have a training population where we have uh, phenotypic and both uh, uh, genotypic data, as you can see here. And then we uh, estimate marker effects in the training uh, population. So we use uh, both the um, phenotypic and genotypic data. And then we come to um, breeding population or, or validation population where we uh, use both uh, the marker effects and the genotypic data. So here we don't use uh, the phenotypic data. We only use the marker effects. And here we use uh, just the step data. And then we go for selection or genomic selection. Now the question is whether genomic selection is, is, is a practical way to, uh, to execute. Well, in animal breeding, it, it has already established uh, its values through different uh, real data sets. In plant breeding, uh, the phenomenon is uh, still at, uh, in, in its infancy, but there are still some uh, studies uh, which, uh, which says uh, the, 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 that there's the highest accuracy of, of genomic. Uh, estimated breeding values. And these are the, some of the, the papers which uh, one can, if, if someone is interested, so they can read. Now coming to the uh, advantages of uh, genomic selection over the classical uh, method. The first advantage is that it is uh, a quick system because uh, you have a low breeding cycle. So they call it a breeder's equation actually. So if you have a, a low um, breeding cycle and the accuracy is high, the accuracy of selection in genomic selection is also high. And then at the end, you select the top one at here. So it means you increase the intensity of selection. And this all means you increase the genetic gain or the genetic improvement. So it has many advantages. Now coming to the um, uh, statistical model used uh, in, uh, in genomic selection generally, there are different statistical models used in, in, in this area, our blood for example, Lasso, Bayesian Lasso, RKHS, Base A, Base B, and so on really. I mean there are quite a few actually. So I was really confused what uh, model is to uh, follow. And the question is, uh, what, which model is to use. Now, we, uh, we can generally uh, put these models into two categories based on the prior assumption of the markers. For the blood, the assumption is that the effects of all markers are normally distributed with equal variance. Uh, and, the, uh, and it is used in the case of uh, polygenic traits. The assumption for the uh, Bayesian uh, statistics or models is that most loci have no effects at all. Only a subset of uh, loci uh, have a larger effects, and it is used in the case of uh, oligogenic traits. Okay, uh, finally coming to the conclusion of genomic selection. Genomic selection is becoming uh, the most efficient way to improve complex traits uh, using DNA markers, obviously, or SNP data. Uh, there is no single genomic selection model to be uh, used as a, as a benchmark in, in, in plant breeding. So uh, the choice of the statistical model actually depends on the uh, genetic makeup of the trait, population structure, and marker density. So the take-home message for today's presentation would be that Cost-effective genomic information is, is, is reshaping the plant and animal uh, breeding, both equal. The gap between the ever-increasing demand due to population explosion and the existing trajectory of yield could be minimized uh, by embarking upon novel, efficient, and cost-effective or cheap breeding methodologies. Genomic selection could be a better option in that respect. So I would like to obviously thank my professor, Rob Snowden, and some uh, people who've been working me uh, and helping me uh, 
in the lab. Uh, and the funding agency of course, the Mary Curie Inter Crossing and the NPZ LMK. So these are some of the references I took. And thank you very much.